afternoon. Let's see, I'm just getting my settings organized at this end. I hope you're all having a wonderful day. And here in Eastern Ontario, it's sort of snowing, sort of raining. Uh, I'm a little bit sad that we're getting rain on top of all the beautiful snow we've finally had this week. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we've had very little snow this winter, uh, which is which is convenient. It's it has stayed um, very uh, it stayed frozen, which keeps the dogs clean, and I'm always grateful for that. But I do like some snow in winter uh, for a number of reasons. One of them being that it really helps build up the musculature in my dogs in uh, with less effort <laughs> on my part. So one of my favorite things to do, which I've been doing this week, is throwing on um, my snowshoes and going for a hike in the deep snow and letting the dogs uh, have a good run and everybody gets a great workout, myself included. We often, if we have a good winter where there's not too much ice and there's a fair bit of snow, uh, we usually come out of winter in better shape than we go in. So it's, it's a really great uh, opportunity for getting us all into condition for spring training. Anyway, hello, welcome, um, Elan Lawler here. And if you're new to me, I coach um, frustrated, anxious, stuck in foundation land dog sport trainers who are looking for um, the tools and skills they need to really achieve the results they're looking for. And I do that by teaching critical concepts in uh, in animal training in general and dog sport training specifically and mindset coaching. So what I've been doing for the past few weeks is this short series on some critical con some of the critical concepts in in animal uh, training and um, uh, and and applied uh, training with your dogs for for dog sports or for anything that you want to train them to do. And we have looked at a series of these concepts over the last month. Today, I'm going to be doing my uh, final concept for uh, to conclude the series, which is about loopy training. And this is a term that is becoming more and more um, uh, widely used, which is great. Uh, a lot of people may be curious to know what it's about and how they can apply it in their training and whether or not they're actually already using it in their training. So this is what I want to talk to you about today. All right, so briefly, uh, last week we talked about poison cues and I explained that a poison cue is a cue where the dog that, we, that the dog receives um, given by the handler but it can also be an environmental cue where the dog no longer really has clarity around whether the behavior that they do will create a positive result or a negative result and so we uh, that so what ends up happening is you have a dog who starts to uh, show poison cue behaviors, which typically plays out as being very getting very slow, getting hesitant, um, becoming reluctant to engage. They often will do the behavior they're asked for, but n but not with that like nice snappy happy um, uh, body language that we love to see and and the speed and precision that we we want in dog sports. So an example would be uh, from everyday life. An example would be let's say you you have your dog out in the yard and you recall your dog into your house, you recall your dog to you, and, um, and the dog slowly comes to you. Well, why is the dog slowly coming to you? Well, the dog is slowly coming to you because sometimes when you call your dog, your dog gets a treat or you play with them or something good happens. Maybe it's dinner time and so on. Um, so, so the dog knows that sometimes when they come when they're called in the backyard, um, something good happens. Other times you just call the dog in um, because you need them to come in. Maybe you're going out, maybe um, you know, you've know you got visitors coming or something. Anyway, you just call your dog in and you bring them into the house and the dog is like, but I don't wanna be in the house, I wanna be outside. So the dog is uh, comes because they are, you know, your dog is wanting to be a good dog, which is always my assumption, they always wanna be a good dog. Uh, but the dog doesn't know is is something good gonna happen or is something unpleasant gonna happen if I listen So they're gonna slow down. We see this in dog sports in a lot of places. So for example um, The most common one that I come across in my coaching is people who come to me with um, start lines where the dogs Won't they either won't hold their start line or they won't leave their start line 
And in that case, we often also have a poison cue. And that definitely is something that I see a lot that is the result of, of the training methods used to train start lines, where the dog is um, one of the, a very popular way to train start lines is you have your dog who is holding, you get them to hold their start, and then you know you throw a toy, and if the dog moves to get the toy, the toy is grabbed and or covered up or somehow somehow then the dog loses loses access to the toy. So that's that's actually negative reinforcement. It's, and um, and the dog you know can can actually find that uh, aversive. So then um, then they're like, okay, I don't know if I should go or not. So they start to become uncertain. I I, I don't know. Am I supposed to run forward or am I supposed to stay still? If I sometimes when I get released, things you know. If I sometimes when I move, good things happen. Sometimes when I move, not so good things happen. So I'm just going to stay here. So that's another example of a poison cue. We see that a lot. There was a question um, at the end of my last uh, live, last week's live, about uh, giving examples for where this might show up in herding, and the one that I find super fascinating that I'm I've been exploring is when we have dogs that get sticky. In, uh, in in herding. So sticky is often, often we do, people just say, oh, the dog just has a lot of eye. The dog's getting hung up on its eye, which, which if you're not uh, in, if you don't know herding speak, that means, you know, if you've, you've ever seen a border collie who gets like all crouchy and then they like kind of freeze and they don't do anything beyond that. Um, there are a lot of things that have been explained, reasons people come up with for why why the dog is doing that. And, and maybe, maybe the dog is just, you know, hung up on its eye, um, super zoned in. But another possibility, at least in some cases, is that there, you might have a poison cue. That slow, sticky behavior can actually, that's what a poison cue looks like in other, in other areas. So I started to wonder, is this actually a poison cue that I'm dealing with? And I was working with a dog a while ago. Unfortunately, with winter, I haven't been able to, you know, we haven't, we've had to pause uh, the training. But I decided that... Um, this is a dog who had been trained and worked for years and I was always just told that he had too much eye. I started to, I was like, well, you know what? This dog really moves freely in all sorts of other areas. He only, he only gets hung up on the walk up. So I thought, well, I wonder if the walk up cue is actually a poison cue for him. And so I started retraining it. Um, and, uh, and that, um, I was starting to see some really interesting progress And this was in a, like a nine year old dog. So um, that just has me thinking a lot about how poison cues probably show up a lot in herding because herding is reinforcement based because the sheep are very, um, very reinforcing for or the livestock, whatever, the ducks and goats and cattle, whatever you're working. There's a lot of that's very reinforcing to the dog, but there's also, you know, typically, traditionally, intentionally and unintentionally, a lot of punishment built into herding training. And so you're going to end up with dogs that have that relationship of like, oh, geez, you know, like if I go forward, I get to work, I get, the, I get you know, to access my stock, that's exciting, but I might get in trouble and I don't know what. Um, sometimes dogs that are actually reluctant to walk into sheep because of the pressure, um, they get yelled at um, and, you know, to, to like get in there, get in there, get in there. And so that you can have that combination of like what's reinforcing and what's punishing happening at the same time. So I think if, if you're looking for examples in herding, I think we probably could find an awful lot of them. And I think it's a fantastic lens through which to examine some of the problems that we, we run up against in herding. Um, I'm going to actually take two seconds right now just to share with you, if you are somebody who is interested in herding, um, I am going to be opening up my new herding program in March. And uh, I don't have a, uh, like a landing page to send you to or anything like that right now. I'm, 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 I focus very much on content and the tech side of things is something I'm working on <laughs> getting better at. Um, but if you would like to know more information about it, you can either throw um, your name in the comments, uh, send me a private message, or join my email list at www.alenlawler.com. That's H-E-L-E-N-E. L A W L E R dot com, and um, you can just get on my email list, and I'll be sending uh, information out about that over the next couple of weeks. So I'm just gonna have a sip here. That's great, Annabelle. I'm I'm really excited about the program too. I think it's gonna be amazing. I just I have this vision for it. It's gonna the the I'm I'm gonna I'll will be sharing more information about it um, uh, in in hopefully by next week. 
So awesome. <laughs> Great, Barbara. And you're absolutely love to have you as well. Okay, so poison cues. Back to poison, back from poison cues. Um, so uh, as I said last week, there are several ways of, of fixing a poison cue. The first simple way is you just change the cue. And so you, you just pick a different word or, or whatever it is that cue is cueing the dog. Now, as you know, having gone through this series of talks, and if you haven't, go back and listen to them. Um, uh, what, what is cueing our dog is not always what we think is cueing the dog. So dogs respond in this constant, what I call a cue picture. So we may say a word, but it's not necessarily the word that's cueing the dog. There may be something else in the, in the cue picture, in the environment, in the context in which this is all happening that is cueing the dog. It might be coupled to the, to the sound we make. It may, might not have anything to do with what the sound that we make. It may very much be you know, a movement we're making, a prop in the environment, or something else. So we need to figure out what is actually cueing the dog, what is actually the poison cue. It can take a little bit of triage. And then you can swap that out for a new cue and, uh, and, and work, retrain the behavior and, and fix the problem. So that's a, that's a great um, solution, very straightforward solution when that is possible, when you can identify the cue and when you can swap it out. I talked about matching law hell last time. I'm not going to recap that. That's not, not a way I'd even recommend doing um, addressing poison cues. Instead, the third way that we, we can fix a poison cue um, is by using loopy training. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Talk, uh, yeah, talk to you about today. Sorry. Okay, so what is loopy training? This is actually a... Um, it's it's a simple concept and it's a and a, and a it's, it can be a little tricky to get your head around. Um, the bottom line of what loopy training is is it's actually just good training, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, but first, I have to step back and describe what a loop is in in training. So when our dog does a behavior or when we do a behavior. Um, we, we actually go through what's called a movement cycle. And I'll give you a very simple example of that, and that is sitting. So I'm just, let me just push my chair back right now. You can't really see me very well, but you'll get the idea. Um, and I actually, this is so simple, but I encourage you to like stand up with me right now and, and do this uh, with, along with me. So you're standing, and then you sit, okay? That's actually half a movement cycle. That's not a whole movement cycle. You have to stand back up again to, um, sorry, I'm just realizing that uh, there's some the light in the background is making me quite dark, uh, to complete the cycle. So standing up, you start standing, you sit, that's half of your movement cycle, and then you stand back up again and you complete the cycle. So if you think of it that way, you have a loop. You have this loop of standing, sitting, standing, standing, sitting, standing. Your dog stands, lie down, stand, stand, sit, stand. So you have that's that's a full movement cycle. If you don't come, if you don't go to the end of the cycle, you only have a partial cycle. And so we want to think about how behavior works in terms of a loop, in terms of a cycle. Now, and I, I actually did describe this a little bit last week, um, but when we are taught the typical ABCs of uh, behavior, um, we're, we're told, so you have A, antecedent, uh, goes to B, uh, behavior results in C, consequence, right? And actually, um, I, two weeks ago, I talked about how actually we can include uh, craving into that sequence. So you have A as your antecedent, your cue picture, what, what um, triggers, uh, tell, you know, sets things up, the context, and then that tr 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 triggers a craving uh, that then um, inspires the behavior that the, that the learner does uh, in order to get the consequence that they seek, okay? And, and when, when you think of it that way, it, we think of it in a, in, a, in a linear fashion. But the reality of how uh, behavior happens in practice is it happens in, in these loops, in these cycles. So... We want to start thinking about our training in loops, not in a linear fashion, which um, is how we are we've been you know traditionally taught is is this linear approach to training. So you, for a linear example, would be 
um, you, you've got your dog set up at the start line, you have a jump, and, and then the, there's a toy, so uh, out front, and the dog, uh, you release the dog, um, so the context, the cue picture is, is the dog uh, is sitting in front of a jump and there's a toy on the far side, and the, um, the, the, the cue uh, that you give is, you know, break or jump or whatever, let's say jump, so you're nice and clear, and so the dog knows that they can go and they jump, and they and then so you say jump, but there's also a jump in front of them. Your dog's not going to jump if there's no jump there. So that's what I'm talking about. When, you know, a cue picture. If you had no jump and you said jump, your dog would probably like look at you funny and be like, "What are you talking about, lady?" So, um, so you have so the the cue, the verbal cue, jump in in conjunction with the jump in front of the dog is what's going to release the dog. The dog's going to go over the jump and grab the toy, but that is not a complete movement cycle. Maybe I'm picking a bad example. Um, hmm, sorry, I just had I just had like five thoughts here. Okay, it can be and it can't be. So let me explain how. So the, the idea that at the end of a movement cycle, uh, a, a movement cycle is complete when the the organism is back in the position to be able to do the, the movement again. So if your dog, you start your dog at a jump, the dog goes over the jump, and, and then lands, that is a complete movement cycle in terms of that jump that the dog could then jump again, right? But if you wanna set up the same jump, so you're just doing a one jump practice, your dog is not, not when it lands and grabs a toy, your dog is not um, set up to then jump again. The dog either has to turn around or you have to lead them back to the front side of the jump and release them again. And that completes that movement cycle. So it depends on how you look at it. But we're talking about good training practices. So when you want good training practices, we want to look at how we can set things up so that when the, when the behavior is complete, the, the dog is in a position to be able to repeat the behavior again. Now, why does this matter? So you have your movement cycle. And then when you add in your reinforcement, the cookie or the toy or whatever, that will reinforce the whole cycle. It doesn't just, so we're, we think, so let like set the dog over the jump and the dog gets the toy. We think the dog is, uh, what we're reinforcing is um, the jumping, but that's not necessarily true. So let's say we release the dog. This is a typical scenario. Dog goes over the jump grabs the toy, starts shaking the toy, runs around, like does a couple of laps of victory lap with the toy in his mouth. He's all happy, he's all proud of himself. Um, and then he finally comes back to you, and then you play a little bit of tug, and then you finally get him, and he doesn't wanna let go of the tug, and then you finally let go of the tug, and then you're like, okay, and then you bring him back to the, um, to the start line uh, to set him up to do the jump again. That whole sequence is in fact your loop that has been reinforced and becomes the pattern. Now, what ends up happening then is, okay, we, we, we reinforce the jump, the jumping, which is good, but we've also reinforced the victory lap, we've reinforced the shaking and playing with the toy, we've reinforced having to sit there and wait for two or three minutes while our dog is running around doing its thing, we've reinforced the dog coming over to us and then having to, you know, maybe have a little bit of a battle to get the toy out of their mouth, um, and then maybe when they let go of the toy, the dog uh, goes off and sniffs for a little bit before you can get them back to the start of the jump. That entire sequence is now reinforced. And that is where we need to start be paying attention to our, our, clean, our, our loops that we're doing and start working on making the loop clean. That would be a very messy loop, unless you want to reinforce all those behaviors, which most of us don't. So if we think of our training, if we set up our training intentionally to be a loop that would be clean so that we're only reinforcing what it is that we want to be reinforcing, then you would do something like you would have your dog go over the jump to the reinforcement and then um, have a way to immediately bring them back to the start line. Or you could have another jump set up in front of them. So they go over the jump, land, get their, their treat, and then they're set up to do the next jump, land, get their treat, set up to do the next jump, land, do their treat, okay? Um, uh, there's a great exercise by, um, in the book, um, Ag uh, Agility Right From The Start, uh, called the Bermuda Triangle for doing uh, weave pole entries. And you take uh, three two by twos and you put them in a circle. 
And so the dog goes through the two by two and then it's set up to do another two by two and then another two by two and they just keep going around in a circle. And then you have this beautiful loop where they're just practicing their, their entries over and over and over again. And each time they finish the one entry, they're ready to start the next entry, which is right set up in front of them. So it's a little hard to just describe this abstractly. Um, I, uh, you know, without, I can't really give you a demonstration <laughs> on the Facebook Live. It's, I don't have enough space in my house. Um, I do actually have an entire workshop on um, on loopy training and also on loopy listening, which takes it to the next level. These are these are housed inside my coaching program, Dog Sport Scholars, which I will be opening up later this week. If this is the type of training you're interested in, really uh, learning more about and and growing and, and advancing your skills, all the concepts that I've talked about over the past month. They're all, I, I have workshops, um, of like full length, like two hour workshops on these topics uh, within the group that you can, you can um, access if you join. And, oh, thank you, Barbara. I'm glad that you, you think that I explained that well. I, 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 I have it in my head very clearly, so I, I, you know, I act it out with my hands a lot. Um, but um, I, I do find that if, you know, having the step-by-step -step in practice with some some video uh, to demonstrate and then get you out there actually um, doing it in practice is the best way to learn how to do really nice clean loops. And so getting back to poison cues, the um, the way the reason that that the clean loop uh, will cure a poison cue is because we can trim out, we can get very, very clear on what it is that we want the dog to do and, and reinforce specifically that and make sure that we eliminate anything that might be um, punishing or aversive to the dog in the loop. And then, and then we, we, you start with a very small loop. So the smallest very, uh, loop of all is just the feeding loop. So literally, sometimes we have to go right back to scratch. Like, can your dog just take cookies out of your hand in a calm fashion? Just go click, treat, click, treat, click, treat. That's the smallest loop, the eating loop. And then you, and then we can slowly start growing, um, expanding that loop and adding in other things. Maybe it's like a hand touch, click, treat, hand touch, click, treat. Follow the hand, touch the hand, click, treat. And then you can see how we get this loop that's growing bigger and bigger. So when we start training, we want to develop more complex behaviors. We want to actually really break them down into this sort of step-by-step -step process. So when you want to have a plan ahead of time where you can, you can sort of have your criteria um, progression established in such a way that you're always just adding that next little step into your loop. Now, one of the things that's really, really important with, with loopy training um, is that um, one of the, the mantra of loopy training, so I, actually I should, I should step back. Loopy training is a term and concept that was developed by Alexandra Kurland, who is a phenomenal horse trainer. And uh, she has a wonderful podcast called Equiosity. If you're looking for um, some great resources on loopy training, I think I've, I've got a couple that I can, I, if, I, if I can dig them up, I'll, I'll throw them in the comments. But um, uh, check out Alexandra's uh, podcast, Equiosity. It's a, it's a horse training podcast. And it has some of the best um, training advice for dogs that you're going to find on the, uh, on the internet. And, and she developed that in conjunction with her work with um, Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz. Uh, and, they, and they come up with this term, loopy training, which uh, is just such a powerful concept to apply to your training. So I, should have, I should have said that right from the start. So look, look up what her work if you want to really go for a deep dive into it. Um, and she does it with horses, and then more and more people are applying these concepts um, in, uh, you know, like uh, even Emily over in Sweden and Hannah Brannigan and, and, and lots of people, Megan Foster and so on and so forth, they're all starting to apply loopy training into their, um, into their various dog sports that they do, agility and obedience and so on. It's, it's a really powerful tool. So my, my hope here today is just to bring uh, some awareness to you about what it is, because you're probably hearing the term and 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 how like the basics the fundamentals of it and then um you know we can we can have more more um uh more discussions around around what it can look like in practice in the group if you want but basically it's just a really important concept for learning how to have um very thoughtful very clean behavior so that when you are adding in your reinforcement you are reinforcing specifically exactly what you want 
And that way we, we avoid getting poison cues among other problems. We avoid building in a lot of junk behavior, which is so, so common. Um, and, uh, and so what I was going to say when I, when I quickly went to, reminded me to, to mention where I, where I learned this concept from, from Alexandra, um, the mantra of loopy training, which she's always reminding us about is that, um, it's really important to understand that when you have your clean loop, you can raise criteria and not only can you raise criteria, but you should raise criteria. So one of the problems that we tend to have also in our dog sport training is that we get something right. So I, <laughs> my old dog wants in the pain I have to go let her in in a second. Um, when we, when we have our, um, uh, we get we get something correct. We tend to do it like ten times. Oh, right. This is what I want to say. So traditionally, a very common way of um, uh, of training, which comes out of different schools of thoughts, is this whole idea of you need to get your dog to to do the behavior correctly eighty percent of the time before you change criteria. And so, let's say you you do something, um, uh, you do a behavior that your dog does a behavior correctly once. And you're like, great, let's see if we can do it again. Does it correctly a second time. Fantastic. Do it again three times. Perfect. Your dog now has done this thing three times in a row correctly. Well, what might happen? Your dog might be like, okay, I've done this three times in a row and nothing is changing. I wonder if I'm doing something wrong. So then you do it a fourth time and the dog's like, hmm, let me try something different. And then you're like, oh, the dog failed. Okay, so that's like, you know, um, a 25% failure rate, three out of, three out of four I need to do it one more time to do it fifth time and the dog does it wrong again. Okay, well now I'm, I'm, now I'm like six out of five, or three out of five, that's a 60% um, success, 40% failure rate. So now there's a problem. So I'm gonna do it again and I'm gonna do it again. And, and the dog ends up, you know, starting to throw in other behaviors and then everything just falls apart, okay? So, I, and I know this to be true because I have been the, the, shape, the shapey at clinics where we, we were sh human shaping. And when I was asked to repeat something over and over after a bunch of times, I started throwing in other behaviors because I, I was like, this, this is too simple. I can't believe that I'm getting it right. I must, maybe I need to be doing something else because we, we couldn't verbalize to each other. It was just me behaving and, and my shaper clicking. Um, and that was such an aha moment for me uh, and how we, we just, we drill our dogs and then the dogs start, the behavior starts falling apart and the behavior starts falling apart because we're asking them to repeat it too many times and they're like, okay, um, I must be doing something wrong because we're not, we're not progressing here. Okay. So when you're doing your clean loop training, you do your loop, your dog does it once. Technically, if your dog does it correctly once, you can move on. I usually like them to do it twice. If I see the dog do the behavior twice in a row correctly, I increase criteria. So anytime I see that and then I, and then we, we work on it till we get the clean loop again, repeat it a couple of times, increase criteria. And we want to increase criteria small amounts and then we just do this little baby stepping along and we, when we grow our, our criteria. So we're always growing the behavior until you get to the end behavior. Okay. When you get to the end behavior, then it's okay to, to, to reinforce, but you don't want to drill it because your dog's going to, your behavior is going to start to fall apart. You want to just do it often enough to sustain it. What ends up happening also with the drilling is we create glass ceilings. So maybe you're sort of partway through training a behavior and you just keep re reinforcing the same thing. That is reinforcing for us because we are having success and it feels good so we keep repeating it. And, it. and it actually is always a little scary to increase criteria because our dogs might not do it and then we, you know, then that's where the mindset stuff comes in. We have to be okay with our dog not being correct. But often where we really like the dog being correct so we keep reinforcing the correct the, you know that behavior over and over again and then we as I said we either have the behavior start to break down or we create a glass ceiling and then the dog doesn't start to progress beyond even when we want them to so when you're doing your loopy training you want to have your um, criteria increase with the clean loop when you get a clean loop not only can you move on you should move on so that's the mantra okay so that is loopy training in a nutshell And what I wanted to share with you this week. And um, again, as I mentioned that um, I, I do teach all of this with examples and trainings. Um, 
uh, I have workshops on it and so on inside my program Dog Sports Scholars. I am going to be opening it up for, um, for new members at the end of this week. Coming up in March, what I'm doing inside the program, what we're going to be doing March is declutter month. We are going to be decluttering our training. Decluttering our training, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean this whole concept of loopy training, getting really clean with your training, that's one piece. So that'll be, you know, that's a part of decluttering our, our, our practice of the training. Working on handler mechanics so that we have nice, clean um, behavior that is, uh, that is very clear to our dogs because um, we tend to be very higgledy-piggledy with our, with our mechanics, with our motion, and that ends up being confusing to our dogs. And, you know, we're, we're, we're a bit of a cacophony in our body language when we, when we talk to them. Um, and so learning how to clean that up is part of uh, decluttering our training. So we're going to talk about the physical practice of decluttering our training, the mental decluttering around our training, which is huge because we have so many um, beliefs and uh, thoughts and, and self-criticisms and, uh, and fears and anxiety and all of that around our training. So uh, that's, that's work that we do a lot in Dog Sports Scholars, but we're going to specifically revisit how to, um, how to really clean up our minds uh, as well as clean up our physical presence and then declutter our training space too. That's always good. Uh, so if, if you're interested in, uh, in joining me on this um, journey, I would love to see you inside the group. Um, again, it's not, uh, it's not open just yet. I'm going to open it at the end of the month, um, or at the end of this month, which is the end of the week. So you can just join my um, email list at www.alenlawler.com, and I'll be sending out more information later in the week. Uh, and I would, uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions and um, I'll, have, I'll have lots more details. I see some comments just uh, passing by. So I'm just gonna scroll back and just check what they are. Okay, so um, Barbara, you wrote, it's very refreshing, but very scary at the same time with loopy training and increasing criteria so quickly. Yes, thank you, that's a really great point. And the way you can increase criteria quickly like that is to have a plan mapped out in your head of what the criteria is already going to be. So you go into your training session and you're like, okay, I'm, I know what my next four steps are going to be for this behavior. And then you're going to work on the first step. And if you get that first step, you can then move to the second step and you know what they are in your mind. And what we can get a little bit scared and overwhelmed by increasing criteria. Um, when we don't have a plan and especially when we're training new behaviors that we're not familiar with and then you're like you're starting you're like okay i got this right um then what um so we you know tech for for you know for the most effective training we want to always go into your training session uh with a plan of the steps that you're going to be working on and um that usually means having very short training sessions i'm i'm not one to you know like i don't train for half an hour i'll train i train for like three to five minutes and I'll go in with a set of criteria that I'm trying to achieve and then I will give it a try. Now I, I, you know, if I'm working on something that I'm pretty familiar with and then maybe things don't go quite as planned, uh, I can usually adjust on the fly because I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, if I can't no, say, let's say I hit a problem um, and I don't know how to solve it, I throw a big scatter of cookies and then I, um, I have a black backup plan. I have a, um, a protocol for ending my training. So my dog always has fun and, and I just uh, end the session there. And then I go back to my the drawing board and I think about it. And then I, I come back and train a little bit later. So if I, if I have a plan forward and I know how to, how to solve things, uh, you know, have my, my criteria steps to follow, I follow those. If I, um, and then if I hit the end of that, that little sequence, then I'm done. And we, we throw cookies and we, we wrap up the training. If I uh, get stuck, um, I may adjust my plan on the fly if I know how to. And if I don't, I throw cookies and I end the training and I try again later. So, uh, so I don't, I don't like plan, I don't plan 30 minute training sessions where I'm going from like, you know, A to Z in, uh, um, over over a long period of time i'm just going to go like a b c and then be done so uh so yes so it, it it shouldn't be scary if you just put a little forethought into it um and 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 then and actually i think it's i love that you brought this up that it can feel a little uncomfortable 
about moving forward quickly, that is a mindset. Um, that's a mindset work. And again, when I talk about cleaning up our training habits, that's a huge part of it. The mindset, understanding these concepts that I'm sharing with you and, and other critical concepts, like really, really grasping conceptually how training works and you link that to the mindset work is, uh, is an incredibly powerful path forward. So, um, I, I would, uh, I would ex encourage you to do a little exploring into, um, the why, why you find that uncomfortable and you might find some really, really great, interesting, uh, beliefs that perhaps need to be shaken up a little bit and, and changed. All right. Thank you so much for being here, for listening. I really appreciate your time. Hope this was helpful and I will talk to you again soon. All right. Bye. Have a great week. Uh, how do I end this? There we go.